Good afternoon and welcome to the subcommittee on planning dispositions and concessions. I'm Councilman Chaim Deutsch and I will be filling in today for Chair Kalos, who cannot be here today. We are joined here with uh, Council Member Ruben Diaz, Senior. Um, Ruben, I can't see who else is here. Yeah, uh, Rafael Sal Salamanca and uh, Deanna, uh, Deanna, uh, uh, Vanessa Gibson and Diana Ayala. Um, today we'll be holding hearings on two projects, LU-232 Park in Elton and LU-240 MEC 125th Street. If you're here to testify, please add a white speaker slip with the sergeants at arms to indicate LU number of the item you wish to testify in that slip. Before we begin on hearings, we will vote to approve LUs 241, 242, and 243, all related to property at 599 Cortland Avenue in Councilmember Salmonica's district in the Bronx, which was the subject of a hearing on October 23rd. These approvals will facilitate the construction of a new four-story building with approximately eight affordable residential units, including a one-bedroom homeless set-aside unit and commercial space. For LU-241, HPD seeks the disposition of 599 Cortland Avenue pursuant to Section 197-C of the New York City Charter, its designation as an Urban Development Action Area and the approval of an Urban Development Action Area project uh, pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law. For LU-242, HPD seeks the acquisition of 599 Cortland Avenue pursuant to Section 197-C of the New York City Charter. And for LU-243, HPD seeks an Article 11 tax exemption pursuant to Section 577 of the Private Housing Finance Law for Property located at 599 Cortland Avenue in Council Member Salomon Salmonica's district in support of these applications. So now I will ask um, Council Member Salomon Salmanca to please uh, make his remarks on this project. Thank you. Thank you, um, Chair Deutsch. Uh, my remarks will be very brief, you know, um, just really excited about moving forward on this project that we've been working on for almost a year and a half now. But just something that I want to point out, this is a eight-story, 100% uh, affordable housing uh, project, and um, I know yesterday I said I, I introduced the bill of a 15% homeless set-aside, and the bill required that any um, development that's getting city subsidies which has 15 units or more, uh, that there will be a mandatory 15% homeless set aside. Uh, this uh, project that we're voting on today, uh, it's only eight units. Therefore, it's not required. It should the 15% homeless set aside bill pass, this, um, this project will not fall under that category. But I was able to negotiate one unit uh, of the eight for a homeless set aside. And it just comes to show, and I know that the administration is here and HPD is here, this can be done. A 15% homeless set aside can be done, regardless of how big or how small this development is. Um, and that's just what I wanted to point out. And with that, I hope that the committee votes, um, votes in favor of this project. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I now call for a vote to approval LUs 241, 242, 243. Uh, council, please call the roll. Deutsch. Aye. Gibson. Aye. Diaz. Aye. The land use items are approved by a vote of three in the affirmative, no negatives, no abstentions, and will be referred to a land use committee for a vote. Thank you. Ready to roll. Mm -hmm. uh, we will now start our public hearing. First, we will start with LUs 232, Park and Elton, and Council Member Salmanca's district in the Bronx. This approval will facilitate the development of 37 housing units affordable to households with income ranges from 27% to 90% of the AMI, including six homeless set-aside units. All of these units will be subject to rent stabilization. Uh, specifically, LUS 232 is for an amendment of the previously approved, approved Urban Development Action Area Project Approval, the disposition of property located at 3120 Park Avenue, Block 2418, Lot 16, and 451 East 159th Street, Block 2381, Lot 43 in the Bronx. This application also requests approval for a tax exemption pursuant to Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law. Uh, I, now, I now open the public hearing on Park and Elton and would like to invite HPD to present its testimony. I see you're up there already, pretty quick. And we're gonna ask the council to administer the oath to HPD and applicant. Um, please state your name before answering. Um, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? 
Alice Friedman. Ted Weinstein. Can you please just say yes that you affirm? Just use your name and say yes that you do. Alice Friedman, yes. Ted Weinstein, yes. Genevieve Michael, yes. Andrea Kretschmer, yes. Terry Belkis Mitchell, yes. Thank you. You may begin. Uh, we'll start with. Uh, yep. I'm sorry? We'll start with the presentation. Go okay. ahead. Uh, Land use number 232 consists of two non contiguous city owned vacant lots located at 3120 Park Avenue, block 2418, lot 6, and 451 East 159th Street, block 2381, lot 43, in Bronx Council District 17 and is known as Park and Elton Apartments. These two properties were initially acquired by the city through in rem title foreclosures for non payment of taxes in 1984 and 1977, respectively. They were then also designated as urban renewal sites in the Mel Rose Commons Urban Renewal Plan and condemned through that plan in 1998. On June 27, 2007, Resolution Number 939, five sites were included in a ULERP action approving the disposition, UDAP designation, and project approval for development through HPD's new foundations program. The original project was envisioned as a 53-unit home ownership project across all five lots with affordability levels between 80% and 130% of AMI. Because of the downturn in the housing market in 2008, the developer was unable to secure private bank financing, therefore the project stalled. In an effort to move forward with the project, the developer and HPD determined a two-phased scattered site rental project was the best option. Therefore, on May 25, 2010, Reso 262, the City Council approved an amendment consisting of a change in development program from new foundations to the low-income rental program as well as a UDAP tax exemption. The first phase has been developed across three lots consisting of 37 residential units affordable to households earning up to 60% AMI. The two lots under land use number 232 remain city owned and undeveloped as the project experienced further delays due to the illness of the principal of the initial development team. Once the development team was reconstituted, the project started moving again. Currently, the developer proposes to construct two buildings on the two undeveloped lots under HPD's neighborhood construction program. And upon completion, the project will consist of 37 units of rental housing plus a superintendent's unit. The project includes a 15% homeless set-aside, which is approximately six units for families referred from other social service agencies, such as the Department of Homeless Services, DHS. There will be a mixture of unit types, including 18 studios, 10 one-bedroom, and 10 two-bedroom apartments. Targeted household incomes will range from 30% to 110% of AMI, and rents will range between 27% to 90% of household income. Therefore, it's anticipated that a studio will rent for 354 Sorry, that a studio will rent for $354 at the 27% AMI level to $2,037 for a two-bedroom apartment at the 90% AMI level. Building amenities for both sites include a laundry room, bicycle storage, and rear yard accessible only to tenants. No commercial space, community facility, or parking spaces are planned for the project. Today, HPD is before the planning subcommittee seeking to amend the project summary, changing from the new foundations program to the neighborhood construction program, and approval of Article 11 tax benefits for 3120 Park Avenue and 451 East 159th Street, which will assist with maintaining affordability for these rental units. <coughs> the tax exemption will be in place for a term of 40 years, coinciding with the length of the regulatory agreement. The current cumulative value of the exemption is approximately $6,699,908 with a net present value of $1,713,406. Uh, I also do just want to thank Chair Salamanca for his support of this project and for going back and forth with us, I think, to get something that everyone is very happy with. How's that? Perfect. Okay, I'm Andrea Kretschmer from Xenolith Partners. Uh, Terry Belkis Mitchell and I will take uh, turns just making this presentation. I know that there's a little bit of time pressure, so we're leaving hard copies with all of you and um, any questions we can answer at the end. So I just want to introduce our development team. Xenolith is a developer of affordable and mixed-use projects, primarily in the city of New York. We've been, um, Terry and I have been working together for six or seven years. We were principals and developers with other development firms before this. 
Xenolith is a certified woman-owned business enterprise by New York City's Small Business Services. We've developed about 600 units of housing and have another couple hundred in our pipeline. Two specific Bronx projects I wanted to mention. One was a mod rehab of a Section 8 portfolio in the Belmont neighborhood. And the other um, is um, a principal at Type A Real Estate Advisors as well. And so we've presented to this committee on 1490 Southern Boulevard. We're building 115 senior units there as well. Again, these are samples of some of our previous work. I won't, I won't take time with them now. Um, projects in Brooklyn and in the Bronx. A feature we prefer to include in all of our projects when they're big enough are community facilities. Here, these are um, a YMCA and a community facility that we developed in East New York. So let's talk about 3120 Park Ave and 451 East 159th Street, which we lovingly refer to as Elton. So that's the other cross street there. The two sites are both located along 159th Street. They're on opposite sides of the street. So just our luck, we have two separate community boards. They're located in multifamily neighborhoods. The main thing I wanted to point out is that on Park Avenue, we're across the street from Morrisania Air Rights and down the street from the fire station. So the sites are about three blocks apart. The existing building, existing site locations, both of them are vacant. There's some vegetation, but nothing, uh, they've been vacant for several years. They're small sites. The zoning there is R72. A uh, quick rendering of each of them. They're both five stories. Um, again, contextual with the existing buildings, sometimes a little bit big, taller, sometimes a little bit shorter. Genevieve mentioned the features. We're doing enterprise green communities. We have recreation space in the backyards, laundry, bike storage, all of that. The building on Park Avenue is going to have 14 units, and the building on Elton will have 24 units. Um, interesting shape of the building on Park Avenue because of the angle at the street front. So you can see on both of those actually the um, recreation space or passive recreation space in the backyard on both of those. Uh, the last thing I'll mention are the project partners that we're working with. Xenolith is, um, has, we're proud to have financing relationships with both the New York City Housing Partnership and Community Preservation Corporation. Our pre-development loan is from the Housing Partnership, and our construction and permanent loans will be through Community Preservation Corporation. Both of those, I'm sure, are well known to the committee. And our architect is GF55. They have extensive affordable housing experience. The builder is going to be DP Group General Contractors, the Bronx-based business, also with extensive experience in higher NYC and with the MWBE, um, complying now with MWBE buildup. Terry. So I'll briefly cover the sources and uses for the project. The development has a total development cost of just under $12 million, which works out to about $313,000 per unit. The construction costs are approximately $263 per square foot, include a plus a 5% contingency, and soft costs are approximately $2.65 million. Two items to note in the soft costs, uh, the environmental expenses were higher uh, than typical costs due to the limited number of units across the project and the fact that they were on two separate sites, so they required multiple reports for each site. And uh, there is a significant amount of soil remediation that needs to be conducted uh, given the history of the site. Um, there, I also want to note that there's no developer fee included in the soft costs, and that is a HPD NCP term sheet requirement. Our sources include a CPC first mortgage. As I mentioned, we'll be using the NCP program through HPD, and we also have some uh, Brownfield funding coming in from OER through the Brownfield Incentive Grant Program and EPA revolving loan funds. There is also a 10% equity requirement associated with the NCP program. Some of the challenges that I already alluded to was the small number of units made it challenging to spread out the costs across a number of units for the sites. And the two separate buildings were not as cost efficient as they would be with a single building uh, when it comes to building systems. And as I'm sure you're aware, interest rates and construction costs are rising. And so we are um, very motivated to close <laughs> and stem that. Now on the unit mix, we have a mix of um, 30, 50, 80, and 90% AMI units. 
nine at 30% AMI, four at 50% AMI, seven at 80% AMI, and 17 at 90% AMI. 15% will be homeless units, and uh, those will include three studios, two one bedrooms, and one two bedroom. Now the AMI for the neighborhood is 30% of AMI, and based on census tract data from the American Community Survey, 13% of local households would qualify for the 50% AMI units, and 20% of local households would qualify for the 80 and 90% AMI units. I do want to note, I'll get to the slide in a second, but we did go before community boards one and three in 2017 to discuss the project, and they were very supportive of the middle income units. They were happy to see them, and they were also uh, excited to see that a WBE was leading this development. The market rate rents are just above the 90% AMI levels, and these 80 and 90% units are really helping to support these lower, the 30 and 50% AMI tiers. Uh, the units will be marketed through NYC Housing Connect, and income certifications and leasing will be conducted by T PWB Management, uh, which does a significant amount of management in the Bronx and throughout the city. We have some construction hiring contact information uh, readily available for the project. And these are just our letters of support from the community boards in favor of the project. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, can you just um, explain um, about the the soil uh, remediation? Um, how much of the property needs to be remediated? Can you speak to that sure. a little bit? Sure. As is common in New York City now, there's historic fill everywhere, and we had some additional. Um, organic, volatile organic, and some semi-volatile organic materials that just are from previous uses, old tanks and whatever else was left on the site. So the cost to, to excavate and then dispose of some of that is a little bit higher than if your land is uncontaminated. So. Uh, who has the oversight of that? We're working with OER, so um, we have some big grants and some EPA funding to remediate those costs. So this is not a DEC project? It is not. Okay. Okay. Right here. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, any members of the committee? Um, Salamanca? Councilman? Okay. Thank you, uh, Chair Deutsch. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so, uh, just so members of the committee know, uh, this project, I've been working on this project for about over a year and a half. Uh, one of the first projects when I first got elected. And uh, the original, uh, the original, um, layout of this project or the original proposal was a 30 37 unit building with five units at 80 percent ami and 32 units at 90 percent ami and i you know and they know this i made it clear from the beginning this was unacceptable to me this was unacceptable to my community we needed to go deeper in affordability and so we went from again 32 units at 90 and five units at 80 to now, the uh, what's being proposed, which is nine units at 30% AMI, four units, well, nine units at 27% AMI, four units at 47% AMI, seven units at 80% AMI, 17 units at 90% AMI, and we got six units uh, for homeless set aside, which is a 15% uh, homeless set aside. So we've come a long way, and I want to thank you uh, for working with me. And again, HPD. This can be done. A 15% homeless set aside can be done, regardless of how big or how small these projects are. And I hope you can send that message back to your commissioner and to the mayor's office. Thank you. We definitely hear you. Uh, thank you. Any other questions from member of the, members of the subcommittee? No? Seeing none. Panel, you're dismissed. Thank Have you. Have a nice day. Enjoy your day. Our second hearing today is for LU 240 MEC 125th Street in Councilmember Yalos District in the East Harlem neighborhood of Manhattan. This approval will facilitate the development of 404 residential units, including 268 affordable and 134 market rate. More than 62,000 square feet of commercial space, 5,800 square feet of cultural community facility, 10,000 square feet of public open space, and 121 parking spaces. I love that. For this project in 2008, City Council approved the rezoning, UDAAP designation, urban renewal plan amendment and disposition for all lots blocks 1790, lots 1, 3, 5, and 6. Parts, uh, part of lots 841, 44, 45, 46, and 101. 
A 2006 RFP related to these properties have been issued by the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Specifically, LU 240 is an application requesting approval of a new tax exemption pursuant to Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law. I'm now opening the public hearing on MEC 125th Street and would like to invite HPD and ADC to present its testimony. Uh, so I'm going to ask the council to uh, administer the oath to HPD and to the applicants. Please state your name before answering. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? Kevin Paris, yes. Lacey Tauber, yes. Stephen Hayes, yes. Ken Spielberg, yes. You may begin. Uh, land use item number 240 consists of an exemption area located at 213 East 125th Street in Manhattan Council District 8, known as MEC 125th Street, Parcel B West. These lots are designated urban renewal sites within the Harlem East Harlem, Ur Ur sorry, Harlem East Harlem Urban Renewal Area. The City Council approved ULURB actions for these sites on October 7, 2008, including disposition approval, UDAP designation and project approval, as well as urban renewal plan amendments and zoning map changes in order to facilitate the East 125th Street project. Parcel B of this project consists of three parcels designated for residential, commercial, community facility, and entertainment development. The East 125th Street project is the result of a collaborative effort between city officials and local community participation that led up to a request for proposals issued by EDC in 2006. Parcel C was the first to close in 2010 and completed construction with 49 residential units targeted to households with incomes between 40 to 60 percent of AMI plus one supers unit and approximately 5,600 square feet of retail space. A portion of Parcel A was the next to close in 2015 and completed construction with a cancer treatment facility known as the Proton Center, which is expected to open in 2019. Land use number 240, which is parcel B West, will be the third phase of the East 125th Street project to close. HPD has submitted for the record a timeline for parcel B that details the condemnation and acquisition process that took place between 2008 when the project was approved and 2018. With that process now completed, the sponsor plans to construct a 19-story elevator building that will include a mixture of unit types, 98 studios, 97 one-bedroom, 197, or, sorry, 179 two-bedroom, and 28 three-bedroom apartments, as well as two superintendent units for a total of 404 units. Of the total unit count, 268 units will be targeted to families with household incomes at 40, 50, 100, and 130 to 165% AMI with initial rents estimated at 37%, 47%, 80%, and 130% of AMI. The balance of 134 units will be market rate. The project also includes 62,204 square feet of commercial space and 5,887 square feet of community facility space, as well as 121 parking spaces and 10,000 square feet of publicly accessible open space. Currently, the plan includes a supermarket as the retail anchor tenant and a dance studio in the community facility space. HPD is currently before the planning subcommittee seeking Article 11 tax benefits for the exemption area in order to assist with maintaining affordability of the rental units for a term of 40 years, coinciding with a regulatory agreement establishing certain controls upon the operation of the exemption area. The cumulative value of the tax benefits is approximately $135,607,967, and the net present value is $36,483,616. <clears throat> Hi, uh, my name is Stephen Hayes, and I am representing the developer, and with me is Matt Icapetta and Frank Dubinsky, also with the development team who can answer questions if need be. Uh, I'm going to give a really brief presentation. You have hard copies, um, so if you have any questions as you go, go on. I, I, I'm not sure if I can work this PowerPoint, however. Do you know how to move the slide? Um, just press the forward or the button. Oh, here it is. Very easy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the agenda is basically I'm going to tell you who the developer is, um, talk a little bit about the uh, program and the affordability mix, give a brief presentation on the architecture, talk about some highlights about local hiring and MWB hiring, and then next steps and timing. Um, the development team is a combination of five partners. Uh, I've outlined them here on this slide. I can tell you a little bit about each of them if you'd like, but it's, they're affordable housing developers. Um, 
Richmond is, a, I think, the eighth largest in the country of affordable housing owners. Um, El Barrio and Hope are both East Harlem not-for-profit affordable housing developers. Monadnock is an affordable housing developer and also a general contractor who will be building this. And Bridges is a retail uh, developer in New York City as well. The program, as uh, outlined here, is um, I'm going to talk about the residential in more detail, but that uh, there will be 270 affordable units, 66% of the units are affordable. I'll talk about those more specifically. The community facility, or sorry, the uh, commercial retail has two floors and two sort of components. The uh, second floor, which is accessed, and I'll show you in the drawing, off of the corner of 3rd and 125th Street is going to be an affordable grocery store. A lease is about to be signed, which is a use that is uh, very much needed in this community. Um, that will help, of course, uh, lease the first ground floor, which has three different sort of uh, retail components that I'll show you in the plan. Uh, the community facility uh, and cultural facility piece, as Lacey mentioned, is going to be a, we're in a, with a term sheet with a dance studio for girls that are, that's located in East Harlem at present. They're going to expand the facility and be in, um, happily, they're going to be in our facility. There's parking, as mentioned, and then there's also uh, 10,000 square feet of open space, which is a through block between 125th and 126th. Um, this is a summary of the affordability. As I mentioned, 66% uh, are affordable units, 33 market. The affordability breakdown is a result of um, discussions with, uh, there's a local task force that's heavily involved in this project. Um, the council member's office is, uh, leads that task force as well as community board 11 members and they have um, been heavily involved in this project from the very beginning. Uh, that includes talking about the affordability breakdown as well as uh, hiring, which I'll talk about in a second. So the, the, this, these bans are a result of that discussion and also um, discussions with HPD and their term sheet requirements. Uh, what I wanted to do here is because there, there sometimes are questions about the 130% um, AMI bands. I just wanted to show that this, even with the, this band, is significantly below what market rate would be, and these are comparables of um, nearby properties to show what those rents would be. And in the green, I guess you can see it. It's green. Is the um, is what the rents would be under the 130% AMI ban? Uh, I'm going to briefly go through the. Uh, architecture, you can look at it, and I can answer any questions, but I'm going to be quick on it. This, um, this drawing shows the entire parcel, which is somehow called Parcel B. I'm not entirely sure the history of that, but it's called Parcel B. The project that we're talking about is the west side, hence the name B West, which is where the green space is and to the left. Um, just to get acclimated, this is 125th Street to the south. Uh, 126th Street, 3rd Avenue to the left, and 2nd Avenue to the right. The other two um, site plans are uh, potential additional phases, which will come in later on. Uh, this uh, is the site plan for the parcel that we're talking about now, B West. What's important here is um, the corner of 125th Street and uh, 3rd Avenue, which is the lower left piece, is the anchor retail that goes up to the grocery store. And then there's the three retail spaces, and then the upper Right is the lobby. It's sort of an orange color for the uh, cultural center that's next to the public open space. Um, I put in these floor plans. I don't know why, because you probably can't see them, but this is a cellar plan. Um, a, a lot of the dance studio, because of their desire, is located uh, in a place that can't be looked into. So the dance studio is up on the upper right portion. The rest of the cellar is attendant parking and some uh, building services. Um, this is the uh, architectural plan for the site plan that I just showed. You can see on the right is a design for a park. That's just a preliminary placeholder. Um, we're working, or we will be working with a task force um, that I was talking about previously to, to uh, do design charrettes to come up with a plan that is um, more desired or, or more appropriate for what the community is looking for in that through block. Um, the second floor plan is really basic. It's flexible grocery store plan, as I mentioned. And this uh, is the third, th third floor and then going up onward up to 19. This third floor shows the amenity spaces, which includes the lounge, library, business center, two terraces, uh, open equally to whoever is a tenant in the building, affordable and uh, market rate tenants. And then the, uh, this is the upper typical floor plan. Again, I'm rushing through these, but you have a hard copy if you want to look at it and have any questions. 
Uh, this is a rendering of the building. Um, this is taken at 3rd and 125th Street, a little bit of a bird's eye view. You can see the lower floors are retail and then the upper one, the second floor is the grocery store. The building to the right on the south side of 125th Street is the Parcel C project, which was the first phase that was developed by this team that Lacey mentioned. Uh, I just want to do a, a, a highlight of some of the uh, MWB participation in hiring concepts. As I mentioned, the 125th Street Task Force has been heavily involved in this, and they have created a, uh, a really helpful outline of what needs to take place for both MWB hiring and local hiring, which includes, hire, includes the hiring of two consultants, one an MWB consultant and one a local hiring consultant that will be done in coordination with the task force. So our team will be creating a MWB utilization plan with EDC and with the um, the task force, and additionally, they'll be doing the same thing for a local, local hiring plan. Uh, a couple of questions came in. I just wanted to put up here that the uh, post-construction jobs will be uh, at or above living wage, and health insurance will be provided, and the grocery store is a unionized grocer. Um, this is going to be closing in December. Construction will start immediately thereafter, and uh, TCO is expected in September of 2021. That's my quick presentation. Thank you. Um, Councilor Mayala, do you have any questions? No questions. Very supportive of the project. I know this has been 10 years in the making. Um, I applaud your patience, uh, HPD. I know that it's been difficult, um, but I trust in the, uh, the task force um, due diligence um, and meeting and coming up with a, with a plan, that, a comprehensive plan for development in this site. And so I am here today to just express my support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask everyone to be a little patient. Uh, the chair is coming back, so he has some questions. So we're going to take a little pause. Okay.
We are coming back from recess on this uh, hearing of the Subcommittee on Planning Dispositions and uh, Concessions. Uh, the Committee Council will continue <coughs> calling the roll. Uh, voting on uh, land use items 241, 242, and 243. Chair Kalos? Uh, in deference to the local member, I vote aye on all. Uh, the land use items are approved by a vote of four in the affirmative, no negatives, no abstentions, and will be referred to the full land use committee. Uh, for the current panel, uh, we'd like to, we, we understand that we have EDC here as well, uh, so we'd like to include them in this panel so that everyone can answer questions together. You will want to pull your chair up to the table. And if you have not been administered the oath yet, please state your uh, name for the record. Molly Anderson. From which organization? New York City Economic Development Corporation. Great. And Dan Moran from HPD. And before we continue, can you just affirm that you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony for the subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? Yes, I affirm. Yes. Thank you. I want to apologize that I was unable to be here earlier. Uh, over the summer, the uh, HPD moved forward with a third-party transfer program, which is a program I do believe in. However, it was not handled properly, and as a result, we have multiple homeowners uh, from low-income communities of color in Brooklyn who feel that their properties were taken improperly. And I took the opportunity earlier today at their request to meet with them and discuss what had happened. And I'm committed to working with those homeowners and their local members to ensure that HPD does the right thing and gives homeowners their homes back where they lived. Uh, and no circumstance should third party transfer be used to take property away from somebody who lives in their building. With regard to the uh, project we are looking at. It is the East 125th Street Development v. West. Uh, and so I think the uh, key piece is this is part of a larger project. Is that correct? Yes. If you can please pull up the slide that has the affordability mix. In this committee, we use a lot of words like AMI and percentages. What does 130% of AMI translate into as far as income in dollars and cents for a single individual? Uh, for a single individual, it's uh, 21930 130% of AMI. Oh, sorry. I thought you said 30%. 130% is... Um, 95,030. Does HPD believe that people earning $95,000 a year are desperately need, in need of affordable housing on East 125th Street? In terms of this affordability mix, um, this was something that was agreed to in the points of agreement when this project was um, originally proposed um, with the community. So it's something that's gone through kind of extensive community process and uh, also the council member is supportive of this project, so. How long ago was, how long ago was this, were the points of agreement agreed to? 2008. So 10 years. Is it possible that 10 years ago, 130% of AMI was far lower than $95,000 a year? I mean, it tends to go up with the median income in the city. Which, which has, there's been an inflationary <coughs> economy. Is that correct? So, so that it's gone up. And now, are these units part of a larger project? Yes. And so, are these meant to cross-subsidize other units? Um, I, I can't speak to that exactly how that would work directly, but I can tell you what we have in mind for the uh, second part of this project is going to be an ELLA, which is our extremely low and low income affordability term sheet. 
Um, and the third phase has uh, affordable home ownership as well as an affordable rental component. So we have EDC available, we have other folks from HPD. Are the market rates units here meant to cross subs the market rate? And I'm going to call $95,000 a year. What, what is the rental for a one bedroom for the 130% of AMI rate? $2,487. $2,487 for a one bedroom in New York City on 125th Street. Uh, what is the, the market rate for a one bedroom on 125th Street? You had a slide about that in your, uh, in your presentation. You want to talk about your costs? Sure. This, uh, what we did is um, we put together a slide of some comparable um, developments and the Second column, which is in green, is the rental for the 130 percent AMI, and the other uh, examples are market rate rents. So I, I'm looking at your slide, and a one bedroom is 2487 for 130 percent of AMI, and at 245 East 124th Street, there are one bedrooms for $2,627 a month. Uh, I'm sorry, which address is it? 245 East 124th oh, right, yeah. Street. Yes, $2,627. It, it seems that these 130% AMI units are, are actually pretty much at market rate. There might be a, a couple of percentage points below, but in actuality, they appear to be market rate. Perhaps a, a five or four percent discount. I don't have the discount, the percentage. I think maybe, Matt, did you have the? I'm, I'm not asking. I'm oh, just okay. saying. Yeah, I, it's le the, that's the lowest of the comps. Right, the, the one, that's the lowest of the comps, exactly. The 130 percent AMI is listed. I mean, they are what they are. Exactly. And then there's 134 at market rate. How much do you intend to charge for them? I, I see you have a range here for one bedrooms from uh, 2627 a month up to $4,650 a month. So are these one bedrooms going to be uh, $4,650 a month one bedrooms on 125th Street? The, the, um, uh, the market rate for the one bedroom is $2,599. Is that... That's correct. Is that part of a regulatory agreement that it cannot go above $2,600? Because a lot of folks would tell you one, that's a lot of money for a one bedroom. All units, um, all units in the building will be rent stabilized, but the market rate units will not be rent restricted. Okay, so... Otherwise they would not be market rate. So you have a vacant unit. Is, can, could you ever rent it for $4,650 a month? Depending on uh, how the rent stabilization laws are applied to a, a, a unit that becomes vacant, um, they could, yes. Okay. But HPD is subsidizing the affordable units, not the market rate units. Do you believe, based on the group of rentals that you, rent rates that you have here, that it is possible that these market rate units uh, would have a gentrifying effect on this community? I mean, I think you have to think of this project in terms of the project as a whole. Okay, um, so, so let's... But, I mean, except that, I mean, for a question like that, you would have to look at this project as a whole. Today we are here to talk about Parcel B West. Um, sorry, were you going to say something? Okay, I thought you were going to talk. Uh, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> you, you are referring to the project as a whole, so I want to speak specifically to the home ownership units. You referred to the points of agreement. Councilmember Ayala has also referred me to the points of agreement. She indicated that under the points of agreement, we were looking at something like 300 home ownership units, which has since been reduced to 166 home ownership units. And at the same time, this property is still receiving about 50 per, this piece of the project is receiving quite a, a windfall to have subsidized a point of agreement that appears to be departed from. So what were the points of agreements 
for the home ownership piece? Were they in fact 300 and changed to 166? What are the correct numbers? I don't have that in front of me. It was 300 and something to 161, but that's something that we're actively talking about with her right now. Um, and and it's a different phase of the project, and it's a it's kind of a ways out, and that's one of the the challenges we, we are as far as giving a, a hard number commitment, but it's something that we're actively looking at right now. Is it consistent to refer to a 10-year-old points of agreement document for saying that we should have 130 <coughs> percent uh, AMI units for people making $95,000 a year and market rate units for people making perhaps more uh, and holding to that 10-year-old document in one place but then not moving forward with making 300 home ownership opportunities available. I think the challenge that we're facing there has to do with how um, you know the way that we finance affordable home ownership has changed. Um, but as I said, it's something that we're actively talking about with the council member, and we haven't come to a final conclusion on what those numbers are going to look like yet. But again, that's for a phase that's further out. For consistency's sake, I think that it is only fair that if you are holding the project to one point of agreement, that another part of the project, which is receiving subsidy from this project, uh, be included. I support my colleague on this. And if HPD is seeking a positive vote on this amount of market rate housing on East 125th Street and uh, housing that is, I don't know many people who would tell me a, a $2,400 a month one bedroom is affordable. Uh, that, that is a lot of market rate and I believe the term you use is moderate income affordable housing. So I, I support our local member on this and if, this, if HPD would like this project to move forward, uh, we do expect to see that 300 units of um, home ownership opportunities uh, that are affordable to, to be honored. Uh, I had some other questions. With regard to this project, are there any, with regard to this project, according to your testimony, uh, did you use eminent domain? Yes. Uh, there have been other occasions uh, before this committee where uh, there were vacant lots adjacent to uh, affordable housing developments that were not developed. Why was eminent domain used here versus in other places? Right. I think you can see from you know the timeline that we gave you for this project that um, eminent domain is no small undertaking. It is a very time-consuming and an expensive process. And I think, you know, the, the city felt that it was appropriate to do that in this case because of uh, the transformative nature of this project and just the amount of benefits that, um, you know, that we're able to provide to the community here. Um, you know, this is a whole entire block um, that's going to be developed with affordable housing, community facilities, a supermarket, publicly accessible open space. And so I think just the, the judgment there is that the time and the expense were worth it for the outcome. And I think sometimes in these smaller projects, it's, it makes more sense to proceed with the project that we can do in a timely and cost-effective manner. When did the eminent domain process begin? Um, I believe it was 2007, is that? I have, I have it right here, hold on. Oh, you, you printed it out. So it was commenced in 2007. When was the project approved? Uh, 2008. And when did the litigation begin? <clears throat> Actually, the project commenced in, in 2007, sorry. The um, approvals were received in 2008. So the approval to move forward with the change in land use happened Actually, in sorry, no. It started in 2007, project approval in 2008. The public scoping... Um, well, the public scoping for the project, which included acquisition of parcels for urban renewal purposes, started in 2007. 
Um, and those approvals were received in 2008, which allowed that process to proceed. And did EDC or HPD offer the residents fair market value? <clears throat> I'm sorry, I don't think that we can get that information at this time. I don't have that information at this time. After, do you know whether offering a uh, existing landholder fair market value for their property is a precondition to bringing a eminent domain procedure law case? I believe that um, um, I cannot speak to the specifics of that. Um, that was handled through our, our um, council at city law. And um, if, if it was part of, um, yeah, I, I don't have the information on that at this time. OK, so there was an eminent. So according right. to mean, records, we, we received that from. The domain procedure law was followed in this, in this situation. And in order to, so when did the eminent domain procedure begin? Um, 2009. And when did the eminent domain case end? Earlier this year. I mean, there, was, there were a number of different pieces of this, but the whole entire process concluded earlier this year. So my, my understanding, based on records previously provided, is that the, the underlying case, the, the overarching case against the landowners, concluded in 2011. And that following 2011, it took three years to identify funding to cover the costs of those proceedings. And then from 2014 to 2017, the city engaged in condemnation and removing the tents, which carried through until earlier this year. Is that, I, I see nodding, but the, the record requires language to be used. Based off the timeline, sure, that's correct. Is that your reading of it? That there was an additional litigation in 2014. Yeah, so there was another litigation in 20, from 2014 to 20, 2017. So there were three court cases as we provided uh, that and added to the timeline here. So I, I will HPD and EDC in the law department provide the full detailed information on what happened here so we can ensure that anyone who lost their property, that all the processes were followed and that public, the notice was provided and that people were paid fair market value in accordance with the United States Constitution. We will provide you some documentation that shows that the law was followed. Okay, because based on the fact that you're telling me that it wasn't one eminent domain proceeding, but three gives me concern uh, because generally when you're, I'm, I'm an attorney, when you sue people, you sue everybody, so you have all parties and interests, so you can handle everything at once instead of having to come back multiple times. Uh, and was HPD aware that I was going to have questions about the eminent domain procedure? That's why we provided you with the timeline in advance. I appreciate it. We received the timeline to less than two hours before this hearing, which meant that we were not able to provide you with any meaningful follow-up. And if you're not providing the information with enough time for follow-up, you should definitely bring the appropriate people. The question I have is just, uh, as a person of the Jewish faith, uh, uh, during the holiday of Passover, some call it Easter, uh, we ask, uh, what is the difference of this evening? Uh, so this has taken 10 years. There are other projects that HPD has come before this committee on that have been stalled for 10 years. Is that correct? 
Yes. <coughs> and it, yeah. in that time, <coughs> could the vacant lots adjacent to the development sites have also undergone the same lengthy and costly process for the sake of affordable housing? I mean, I think there are various reasons that you've seen project delays. I, I think adding eminent domain on top of that, you know, could have potentially delayed these projects even further and cost more money. I mean, I'm, I'm not really sure how I can answer that question differently, but I think, you know, as an affordable housing agency, we have to be really conscious of, you know, doing things in a cost-effective way so that we can provide as, mo as much affordable housing as possible because that's our goal and our mandate. Is the man isn't the mandate to build a target of three hundred thousand sorry, build or preserve three hundred thousand units? <coughs> right. How are we gonna do that if we're leaving vacant lots next to existing affordable housing development? We're gonna do that in a uh, in all the ways that we're doing that right now. <laughs> So what's going to happen to the vacant lots like what we saw two weeks ago where it's, there's a vacant lot sitting right next to an affordable housing development? Is that just going to sit there vacant? I mean, I can say if, if that situation is the case, um, we almost always, I think, uh, encourage the development teams to reach out to the owners of those properties from the very start of these projects, right? And uh, sometimes they're able to acquire those properties in a way that is cost effective and efficient. Sometimes they're not, but it's, we don't ignore it. You know, we are, we are thinking about that. If you have, so, so the, the building that was previously heard before I was here was how many units? I'm not working on that project. I'm sorry. How many units? 15? I believe it was eight units. Eight? And, Hmm? Oh yeah, eight units was the one from the, that was voted on today. So the project the one that we voted we on today. Earlier. At, Hold on, I can get. I can get. No, no, it's okay. Let Let's just do the one that we just voted. So it was eight units, but it's an, it was adjacent. We just voted on it. It was to eight units, but it was adjacent to an empty lot, <coughs> and it was a project that had been stalled for, I believe, a similar length of time. And with eight units, that building didn't get an elevator. If it had a larger lot, could it not have had more units? Could it not have had an elevator and been more quality affordable housing than what they were able to put into such a small not lot? So it doesn't stand to reason that we should use eminent domain whenever we can't put vacant properties together to build more and better affordable housing? I mean, again, I think that it is a long and costly process, and it's a judgment call that gets made on a case-by-case -case basis as to whether, you know, that process would, in fact, uh, lead to the outcome of, you know, more and more cost-effective affordable housing. I, and I guess the, the question here is why did you choose to do it here versus not there? Right, and I think... As I said, this was an opportunity to, you know, this is again like a whole a whole city block. The transformational nature of a project like that is very different from a small lot next to a small site. We, we will continue to disagree. Uh, this is going to bring a a supermarket to this area of the city, which is currently a food desert. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, is that in the regulatory agreement? If the landlord is not able to find a supermarket. Uh, or chooses to change, will that, what will happen? The lease has already been signed with the supermarket. Is there a restriction or a covenant on the lease that rest <coughs> restricts it only to a supermarket use? No. It's a lease with a supermarket provider. I need you to speak into it's the It's a lease mic. with a supermarket provider. How long is the lease with the supermarket provider? Ten years. Ten years. You can, you can use that mic. <laughs> You gotta turn and put press the button. All right. <laughs> ten years. <laughs> and in ten years, can the developer replace that supermarket, which is desperately needed, in the community with uh, 
a, a something that is uh, a a check cashing company, which is not needed in that community. And there's a Pretty forty-five thousand square foot space, so it's really suited for a large um, retailer like a supermarket. Uh, points of agreement. Is there any restriction on use? Could it be converted into um, a, uh, a liquor license establishment? Yes, we do not permit that. Uh, any HPD financed program that's subject to an H uh, project that's subject to an HPD regulatory agreement is prohibited from selling liquor on the premises. Uh, vape. <laughs> I don't know if we've added that. I, I guess what, what I'm trying to get on, there's a whole host of uses that are not welcome in that community or any community. Are you willing to add a restrictive covenant to the space that restricts it only for being used as a supermarket? Without going through it. the community board approval and giving the community board an actually a binding vote. We can look into it. I, I will tell you that EDC has put in similar uh, covenants on leases. I have seen them. I have read them. Uh, and you would you also put in a covenant that if you change the use from a supermarket, it must go through community board approval? Mm. We could. We consider. can look into it. Okay. I, I, have an, I have an EDC space in my district that was supposed to be a supermarket and it's been vacant and we are working with, in good faith with EDC to actually turn it into a, 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 a use that is suitable to the community. So I, I would just say that that is something that we as land use should require as part of it. It should be a part of a restrictive covenant. Uh, but that is definitely good news. I'm just checking the presentation materials to see if the litany of questions that I ask every developer was already answered. I do not see that it was. There is a, there's a slide toward the end. Here, we can pull that up. There you go. I see the MWBE yeah. question that was read into the record, and this will be scanned and available. Yes. Uh, okay, uh, I do not see the project cost. We're going to run through the project costs, hard costs, soft costs, and all sorts of uh, pay structures and how you tend to treat people. What is the project cost? One second. Total development cost is approximately $214 million. Um, hard costs um, anticipated around $154 million. Soft costs around $44 million. And all the units being built will be rental? Yes. Correct. With regards, this consists of 10 lots. How many lots does this consist of, and what is the combined square footage of the lots? Um, I have 10 lots at 463. Oh, you know what? That's in the testimony. One sec. We will skip that then because you've already testified for yep. it. You are seeking an Article 11. You've indicated that Ten this lots. is 90. Uh, that there will be a uh, tax abatement of 135.6 million cumulatively and with a net present value of 36.4 million or $90,000 per dwelling unit. Are you receiving any additional HPD subsidies? Yes, the HPD is providing um, subsidy through our mixed middle income program. And what is that? What is that subsidy? The subsidy amount is still being negotiated with the development team. Um, the term sheet maximum for a project of this type is $95,000 per dwelling unit. In a previous hearing, I learned that you're allowed to go beyond the maximums. Is that something that you're allowed to do under the mixed middle income? When required, but in return for providing over term sheet subsidy, we always require some sort of additional um, commitment from the developer. So the maximum is 95000 You have not negotiated it, but it could go higher. Is there any additional HPD subsidy? Uh, I think there's ResAway funding provided by uh, the council member. Um, and that is, that's the extent of the subsidy. Uh, do you know how much the ResAway funding is from the local member? I believe it's $6 million. $3 million? $3 million. Three million. Three million. 
three million dollars in res in capital funding from the local member. Is that all from the local member? Or the council as a whole? Wow. Okay, that is quite a lot. Uh, are there is there an HPD uh, is there any HPD financing being provided to the lender? Sorry, to the builder. The M square subsidy I mentioned previously. So it's ninety five thousand. That's a uh, that's in financing. It, it would be a loan. Okay. And how what will the will there be any interest on that loan? The developer does not pay interest, but interest accrues, defers, and accrues, and is due at the end of the loan term. That's one way that we encourage folks to re-sign their regulatory agreements. Has anyone ever actually uh, chosen to pay off the loan versus re-sign? It's a newish uh, way of doing things, so we haven't actually come up on the end of any of those regulatory agreements yet to, to find that out. So given that the intent is to re-sign, when it is re-signed, does that 95000 plus interest carry over, or does it just... Uh, get waived. What is the intent? So it wouldn't be waived. Again, this is something that we haven't had to treat yet, but it would either be refinanced or extended um, due to, you know, uh, or alongside. So some might argue that this is actually a cost, not necessarily. And what is the city's, how much, what is the interest rate that the city borrows it at, the 95000 Well, we lend city capital dollars, which are, you know, tax dollars. And I don't know that we're borrowing the money. Per se. If so. The expense budget comes from our annual income. The capital budget is a budget that we borrow every year. So, if it is coming from city capital budget, that that means we have, that is money we are we are people are loaning to us, which means the city is paying interest on it. I don't have the answer. Yeah, to I don't that know right the now. details to that. Will you share that answer? Excuse me. Will you share the answer on what our cost is to borrow that money? You mean across the entire city, how much it costs to, to generate city capital dollars? There are different tranches of, of city capital. There's different types of city capital that is uh, when we go out to fundraise. And so I'm asking at what rate the city is borrowing this money and what the terms are for the investors. So the investor puts in and they get a guaranteed rate of return, and that's how we maintain our bond holding. Uh, different bonds have different rates. So I'm curious about the rates for the M3 bonds. M squared. It's, we can, uh, we can yeah, we'll certainly ask if uh, Sorry, that the information is available. I promise it's available. It's something I argue with the uh, OMB director about every single year because they have different estimates on the cost of capital. And as a result, we argue about it. Is there any financing from HDC being made available? Yes, HTC is providing bonds and corporate reserve subsidy. And how much are those? Um, the corporate reserve subsidy is fifteen million. Is that correct? Uh, the bonds are—I'm um, not sure what the total amount is. And it's still, you know, subject to negotiation. So, are there low-income housing tax credits on this project? There are. And how much there? I believe that that number is also subject to review and um, to finalization. Any federal funds in this project? No. Any state funds in this project? No. Developer private funds and developer equity? I don't know the answer to that, but my colleague uh, there is uh, $20 million in economic equity and $16 million in tax credit equity. Can you just repeat that for the record? Into the mic. Can you say it again? Sorry, I'll repeat it in. There's approximately $20 million in economic equity coming from the developer, as well as $16 million in tax credit equity. By economic equity, you mean money? Cash? Can you say that? He means developer equity. No, I, I, I got it, but I heard economic equity, and I was assuming it was cash, but I wanted to make sure that if, good. Uh, j just for reference, I asked this at every single hearing, so to the extent 
HPD would consider including it in their testimony. It would save us and everyone watching at the TV a, a lot more time. Uh, what was the original FAR on this development site, and what will the FAR be? The zoning was changed in 2008. The, to that, accommodate this that development. That approval happened. Do we have this? Do we have that with us? I, sorry, we can, yeah, we can get that reference the original uh, approvals. Will you provide what the difference in value between the floor area is that was generated? The goal here is we want to find out all in how much money is the city putting in, how much taxpayer dollars are going in, what is the total cost of the city, so that as we look at each development, we can see how much is it costing to put up a market rate unit that the city is subsidizing in 125th Street, and how much is it to do the same thing in the Bronx, mm -hmm. and what are the tools that we use, and how much does the developer uh, need to do in, in all these pieces. Uh, is it mandatory inclusionary housing being applied on this? The rezoning to this project predated the mandatory inclusionary housing program, so it does not apply. There's no inclusionary housing. Okay, let's get to the fun part, which should be really easy. Uh, the mayor signed an executive order stating that commercial spaces of certain sizes through si that receive city funds require that people are paid a wage commensurate with the local community, that they have certain benefits such as health and uh, what have you, will the commercial space such as the supermarket and others uh, be required to abide by this executive order? We actually have our legal team looking into that right now. Okay, to the developer, do you believe that the tenants in your building should be paying the people who work in this supermarket? Uh, more than just the minimum wage and that those folks deserve to be paid a wage that they can live and afford to live in your building and have health insurance and be able to retire one day. Of course. Uh, will you agree to pass those terms on to your tenants and would EDC agree, regardless of whether or not this executive order applies, that this should apply to this building given the serious amount of millions of dollars in taxpayer dollars going into this project. I mean, uh, I do want to mention, you probably noticed that the, the grocer is a union grocer. Um, I'm not allowed to ask if it's a union grocer. I'm, I'm only allowed to ask about right, right, I'm say that. whether or not we're treating people fairly. Uh, uh, and, and what do you call it? What are, so, and part of those terms, you believe that they will have health insurance and have a, a rate that is negotiated as a wage rate that is commensurate with the neighborhood? I and think the, so. Okay. And is there a commitment for all of the commercial spaces to have similar agreements? I'm not sure if there's commitment for the other retail pieces. How much other retail is there? I believe it's 60,000, so 35,000 for the, so that still leaves out 25,000. 40, 45,000, the grocer is 45,000 square feet, so the remaining 15,000 15, will be broken up into smaller spaces and may or may not um, these, these service workers, same question? The, the service workers within the building? Yeah. Yeah, they're going to be paid at, a, at or above a living wage and health insurance will be provided. And, and will they, so the health insurance, will they get retirement? I don't know the answer to that. Do you have a retirement? Do your employees have a retirement? Uh, personally, no, but I mean, you mean the members of the partnership? There are five members of the partnership. I can't speak for all of them. But you, you as an employer, do you offer 401ks or other uh, retirement products to we your do not employees? My company, no. Do you think they should? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, do you think that th those working in your building should also have access to retirement vehicles? Sure. Will you commit to that? I can't commit to that. I mean, it's. I, I will certainly hope for it and look for it, yes. Okay, um, that I, I, the, the easy question is usually just yes or no. I, I prefer yeses and then similarly for the uh, people who will be building your site, this massive site with, with hundreds of units, will they be paid enough so that they can afford to live in this affordable housing? And, and my preference is actually that they can just, that, that you're paying them enough so that they can live in your market rate units. Otherwise we're just contributing to the affordable housing crisis. Right. I I am deferring to the contractor here, but I assume the answer is yes. Yeah. Yes. 
Okay, so the and so the contractor will be paying a wage that is commensurate with area standards, health insurance, disability insurance, and retirement benefits. Uh, I don't believe all the things. If you're asking about living wage, yes, I believe we paid living wage. I need somebody to say something on the record who's taken an oath. Yes, the contractor will be paying living wage. Does living wage mean fifteen dollars an hour? Today's living wage is lower than $15 an hour. The $15 an hour goes into effect on January 1st. You do not break ground or close before then. This is, you're paying people minimum wage. That is not living wage. Uh, so I, I would just say that, do you think that people should get paid minimum wage to put up this building and that folks who are just getting paid a minimum, do you think that is appropriate? But would you agree Personally? to it? Yes. Sure. Oh, do I think it's appropriate? I, I'm sorry, restate the question. I, I'm not sure I understand. Do you think that we should pay people more than minimum wage for doing dangerous construction work? I don't know enough about this to answer that question, to be honest. I mean, it seems like a good idea, but. <clears throat> would you go to a doctor who is making $11 an hour? No. Would, would you trust somebody to do work in your house where you live with your family and, and fix pipes or things that could fall on you at $11 an hour? I don't. I mean, I, I would think no, but I don't know what the... So would you commit to paying people wage rates for people doing expert work? I'm looking to Frank. I'm looking When you have an expert who's got years of experience on the job doing carpentry work or doing sheet metal or tying rivets, you need to pay people for their expertise. Would you be, will you commit to paying people what the commensurate rate is for the expert work? Yes. Yeah. You don't have to what I'm saying, but the majority of Do you want to just get sworn in? Sure. Let's do that. I do want to thank the developer for their honesty. And so can you please state your name before answering? And do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and answering all the subcommittee members' questions? Yes, I'm Frank Dubinsky from a non development. The answer is yes. Thank you. So to answer your question, uh, the majority of workers on uh, project sites make far above living wage. Uh, there are some workers who make at living wage who perform jobs that are not uh, considered expert jobs, so I can't speak to an entire project site. I, I'm familiar with Monotonoc. Uh, I, I believe your firm has, uh, your firm or uh, your subcontractors have threatened to sue me personally and individually. I'm certain uh, we have not. I, I am certain I have a copy of uh, documents or research from, I believe, either you or one of your subcontractors. Uh, so I, I understand that in certain places you pay people a minimum wage, and in other places you pay people uh, a wage commensurate with the area. Do you know if this project is when we're planning the minimum wage or you're paying uh, a commensurate, or if you plan to bid out each and individual project uh, 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 in something that is typically referred to as open shop? Uh, this is an open shop project. Uh, okay. So that means there is no commitment to wage standards, no commitment to health insurance, no commitment to disability insurance, and no commitment to uh, having, uh, what do you call it, retirement benefits. Is that correct? I don't know the answer to that. I don't, I don't believe that's correct. So, so either you're doing all those things or you're not. So which one is it? Well, I, I, don't, I don't know if I agree with that. Uh, I think you, sometimes you do some of those things and sometimes you do all of those things. We can get back to you on the specifics. Okay. Uh, is Monotonoc an MWBE? Monotonoc is not an MWBE. Will you work with MWB subcontractors? Absolutely. We do on every project. Okay. Uh, and then for the developer, will you be hiring, is the developer an M you, you are, you, the developer is not an MWB, but you do have a utilization plan for approximately $14.6 million. Uh, there is a local hiring plan with the 125th Street Development Task Force. 
Uh, if somebody is watching at home and just learned that there is a local hire requirement here and somebody can get a job working and building this building on 125th Street, hopefully for more than the minimum wage, who do they call? Where? Uh, there is, as you just no noted, there is a East 125th Street Development Task Force, which is coordinated by the council member's office and the community board 11's office, and they can certainly reach out to either of those offices. They, uh, the task force is put together, as you just mentioned. So they can call council member Diana Ayala, and you will be able to connect people with jobs at Monadnock or at your site to do work in their local community. Is that correct? Correct. That is great news, and uh, I, that, that's pretty cool. In order to maintain this property as affordable and definitely uh, beyond, so this is not permanently affordable, it will only be affordable for 40 years, and then after 40 years it will have to be renegotiated? It's actually all the affordable units, the 67% affordable units will be permanently affordable. So in 50 years, still affordable? Yes. 100 years? Permanent. Millennia, 1,000 years. <laughs> permanent means permanent. So is there is something that runs with the deed? Yeah, our regulatory agreements run with the land. So is it a deed restriction? Uh, of sorts. Yay. I would like to see more deed restrictions on uh, these projects. There are additional questions that HPD has promised to answer along with uh, folks. Um, so please make sure to get those to us. Please get us the additional details on the eminent domain. Uh, for the 10 years that this project has been stalled, uh, have the properties been paying taxes? Um, the properties would be exempt from taxes when they're under city ownership. So to the extent that the date of, at which the condemnation took effect and the city took ownership of those lots, they would have been tax exempt. What is the uh, cost in lost tax revenue for the delays on this project? We'd have to calculate that. Will you provide those? We can look to see what we can pull up together. That is a new question here forthwith moving forward. Uh, similarly, what is the cost in affordability years due to the project delay? How many years? What do you mean by that? Uh, how many years of affordable housing did we lose with this ten-year delay? Not ten years. I don't. What you, I'm not. I'm not sure what you mean. I'm sorry. The administration does this thing where you say, "Okay, there's 200 units that are part of this project, and it's a 40-year or 100-year." deal, so therefore it's this many years. So in this case, it, it's, it's how many units of affordable housing on this? 166? 270. 270. So let's just say it's, you're, you're using the 100-year mark or whatever, you would say that this is uh, 27,000 years of affordable housing. Uh, so my, my question is on the flip. This, is what th this was the measurement used in the IBO report to determine the affordability garnered by uh, Peter Cooper Stuyvesant Town. So I'm just trying to quantify both the financial cost of the delay as well as the cost in affordable housing unit, units and years. Okay, that is not a calculation that I'm familiar with, but we'll take a look. Okay. Uh, I would like to remind HPD that there are points of agreement. These points of agreement are a decade old. You are holding the points of agreement on the terms of the affordability of this piece of the project, but you are not abiding by those same terms for the home ownership units, then that is important to me. It is important to the local member and that this project will not move forward as a whole if you are not following all of the terms as a whole. I want to thank you for answering as many of the questions as you did. 
there are more questions that remain outstanding. I'd like to excuse this panel and ask if there's any members of the public who wish to testify. Seeing none, I will now close public hearing on land use item 240, and the application uh, will be laid over, except for the fact that we need, within the next 72 hours, all the questions that we asked uh, answered. This concludes today's hearing. I'd like to thank the Council and Land Use staff for reporting, preparing today's hearing, and members of the public and my colleagues for attending this meeting and is hereby adjourned. <laughs>